Uh, on behalf of the Caribbean Tourism Organization, I warmly welcome you to the Caribbean World Tourism Day Forum 2024. My name is Narendra Rangulam, and it's an absolute honor to serve as your chair for today's event. Before we begin, I just want to recognize, uh, a, you know, for, for protocol reasons, uh, a couple of our attendees. So I want to recognize the Honorable Ian Gooden Edgel, the Minister of Tourism and International Transport in Barbados, and also our newly elected chairman of the Ministerial Council of Ministers at the Caribbean Tourism Organization. The Honorable Adrian A. Thomas, Minister for Tourism, the Creative Economy and Culture, other ministers, commissioners of tourism, Mrs. Donna Regis Prosper, Secretary General and CEO of the Caribbean Tourism Organization, heads and representatives of partner organizations, conference panelists and moderators. Again, thank you for your, your time. Uh, directors and CEOs of tourism boards, authorities, hotel and tourism association executives, specially invited guests, members of the media who've logged on, and of course, conference attendees. All protocols being observed, as we convene today, we are united by a collective vision for the future of tourism in our vibrant Caribbean region. The theme this year, resilience and renewal, building a peaceful future. To officially open our proceedings, I would like to invite the Secretary General and CEO of the Caribbean Tourism Organization to deliver the opening remarks. Please join me in giving a warm welcome and virtual round of applause to our Secretary General and CEO, Mrs. Donna Regis Prosper. Thank you very much, Narendra. Good morning, everyone. Protocol having been established, I warmly welcome you here today to this virtual event. Thank you so much for joining us as we celebrate World Tourism Day 2024 under the theme, Resilience and Renewal, Building a Peaceful Future. It's an honor to welcome such a distinguished group of industry leaders, pioneers, and visionaries to this forum. I want to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed speakers, including our newly appointed chairman, Honorable Ian Gooden Edgel, who is also the Minister of Tourism and International Transport in Barbados for offering his valuable insights and expertise. Special thanks to our featured spe speaker, Timothy Marshall, Chairman of the Board of Directors for International Institute for Peace through Tourism, Stenovnik Destang, CHDA President, and the UN Secretary General who will deliver remarks via video. Honorable Adrian Thomas, Grenada's Ministry of Tourism, Fian King, Director of Tourism of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and all of you who are contributing here today to this event in invaluable discussions. Your collective insights will undoubtedly help us and deepen our understanding of how tourism can be a catalyst for peace and resilience, especially in a region like ours that is so vulnerable to external challenges. As we reflect on the theme, resilience and peace, it is crucial to recognize that our tourism sector plays a vital role, not only in economic recovery, but in fostering understanding, unity and sustainable growth. This morning, we will hear perspectives on how tourism can contribute to crisis recovery, building peace and inclusive development. Later today, I will also be speaking at a forum in Curacao about the future of sustainable tourism. I will emphasize that people are at the heart of tourism's success and fostering peace is integral to the building sustainability and inclusive growth. Whether we're discussing the impact of natural disasters like Hurricane Beryl or the need for gender equality or regenerative tourism, today's conversations will highlight the power of collaboration and the importance of ensuring that tourism remains a driver for positive change in the Caribbean and beyond. Once again, thank you for participating in this important dialogue. I look forward to the invaluable insights that will emerge from today's sessions. Together, 
we can build a peaceful and resilient future for Caribbean tourism. Thank you very much for being here today. All right, and thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Regis Prosper, for your inspiring words and for setting the tone for our discussions today. One of the key phrases that came out uh, of your message was tourism as a driver for positive change. You know, your leadership continues to guide us as we navigate the complexities of our industry. So thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, next, I have the pleasure of introducing the newly elected chairman of the Ministerial Council of Ministers at the CTO, the Honorable Ian Gooding Agile. Please join me in welcoming Chairman Gooding Agile to share his welcome remarks. And good morning, everybody. Um, and thank you very much um, for your welcome. Uh, let me first of all acknowledge the presence of the Honorable Adrian Thomas, um, other colleague ministers and commissions, commissioners of tourism who will join us. Uh, let me also acknowledge, um, albeit he's not here at this time, uh, Secretary General of the UN Tourism, who will be joining us shortly. Um, Savanik Destan, uh, President of the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association. And let me also please extend my congratulations to you and on, on becoming the new president of the CHDA. Of course, our Secretary General, Donna Regis Prosper, and members of the Secretariat of the CTO, Mr. Timothy Marshall, Chairman of the International Institute for Peace Through Tourism, and of course, um, speakers, partners, panelists, other invited guests, uh, members of the media, um, and of course, directors of tourism who are joining us this morning. I'm indeed uh, absolutely delighted um, to join you this morning um, to give a very brief remarks at uh, this virtual forum on resilience, um, building a peace, resilience and renewal, building a peaceful future. Um, this is in keeping with the CTO's mandate, of course, of developing a broader um, range of activities for our members. And I'm very happy that the CTO um, decided to um, continue and to follow the umbrella theme of UN tourism in adopting this for today's meeting. Of course, we are all well aware that tourism is a powerful force for good. Uh, it's fostering peace, it's about promoting inclusivity, it's about driving economic activity and growth within the region. It's also about empowering our young people and by embracing sustainable practices and investing in its people in the Caribbean, we will certainly continue to thrive as a world-class tourism destination. The role of tourism resil resilience and crisis recovery uh, is simply one that says to us that tourism is the lifeblood of Caribbean economies. Uh, it provides employment, it generates much needed foreign exchange, it supports national and regional prosperity. It also opens minds. Uh, tourism has shown resilience with a record number of, <clears throat> excuse me, long stay visitors and, <clears throat> excuse me, and cruise passengers. The industry, of course, must continue to be inclusive, ensuring that marginalized groups, local artisans, rural communities, and small business, business owners benefit from its growth. The Caribbean has faced significant challenges due to natural disasters, pandemics, and the looming threat of climate change. Tourism is all critical to helping us recover and to rebuild. And by integrating peace building strategies into our crisis response and recovery efforts, we can strengthen our resilience, allowing the region to thrive even in the face of adversity. And of course, within a region that sometimes have its um, um, <clears throat> share of hurricanes, unfortunately so, this could not even be more uh, emphasized at this point in time. <clears throat> um, our commitment to peace, inclusivity, and sustainability includes that the fact that tourism must continue to be uh, aligned with the region's identity as a peaceful, multicultural destination. Um, <clears throat> our people, with their warmth, uh, uh, hospitality, rich cultural heritage, not only enhance the visitor experience, but also contributes to a global um, sense of solidarity. Tourism fosters, as we well know, cross-cultural exchanges and promotes peace through shared experiences and mutual respects. And in everything, it calls upon us from the public and private sectors to, to tourism and beyond to unite for peace, inclusivity, and sustainability. 
We are committed to sustainable development at the CTO, environmental stewardship, and inclusive growth that ensures tourism benefits everyone from the local communities to international travelers. Um, tourism has that unique ability to build bridges, foster understanding, and create spaces where people from different walks of life can connect and flourish together. And this all sums up the sum total of partnership and collaboration. Achieving this vision will certainly require strong collaboration between governments, private sector and development partners, and local communities, of course. Together, we can enhance the positive impact of tourism across the Caribbean. Cross-cultural exchange is imperative to this ideal. Today's forum provides the perfect opportunity to share ideas, discuss challenges, and explore strategies for maximizing tourism's role in building a peaceful future. I'm particularly excited about the involvement of tourism professionals, students, and of course, practitioners in today's discussions. They represent the next generation of leaders who will carry forward the vision of, of a more resilient and peaceful tourism industry. Investing in and empowering our future leaders ensures that our tourism sector remains dynamic, adaptive, and a driving force for positive change. And as I said earlier, tourism opens minds. So with those brief remarks, let me extend um, a great thank you to all those persons who will be joining in today's meeting. Um, regrettably, I can't stay with you um, for the entire duration of this morning session because as a yeah. your minister, you have um, other duties. But I certainly look forward to the outcomes from this session. I once again extend thanks to all of you for taking the time out to join the CTO in this wonderful but virtual session. I thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister uh, Gooding Agile, for your insightful remarks and continued advocacy for the Caribbean tourism sector. You know, I, you spoke about peace, inclusivity, uh, investing in people, the importance of the industry to the people of the region, and of course, uh, the most important uh, message that came out of there the multiplier effect of it and how it impacts upon. Uh, those individuals um, in the Caribbean region, you know. Um, so thank you so, so much again. Uh, now, let us hear from the president of the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association. Please help me and join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Sanovic Destang to the virtual stage as she shares his remarks. Good morning, everyone. Greetings and happy World Tourism Day from the CHDA. And from St. Lucia, I've waited a long time to say this, the home of the world's fastest woman, Julian Alfred. Today, in addition to being World Tourism Day, is actually Julian Alfred Day here in St. Lucia. It's a holiday. And we're celebrating her incredible achievements as a nation. Julian's story ties into the theme of tourism and peace in a meaningful way. She grew up in a community where peace was not always the norm. Yet she rose above it with the support of her village, bringing global attention to St. Lucia. Uh, a little known fact is that her mother actually worked for many years, decades, in fact, in the hospitality industry, illustrating how deeply interconnected our communities are with the industry. Just yesterday, she was named St. Lucia's tourism ambassador, adding to what has already been a banner year for our sector. St. Lucia, like the rest of the Caribbean, has exceeded expectations and the speed of its tourism recovery. As our past president, Nicola Madden Greg has shown, we have been the fastest growing region in the world for post pandemic tourism arrivals, driving overall economic recovery, as has been mentioned earlier, in the region. But is that the full story? Studies from the WTTC, IADB, and CDB show that our recovery has, in fact, been a bit uneven, with sectors such as agriculture, manufacturing, and even some parts of the tourism sub subsector lagging in terms of their recovery. Similarly, some groups, women, youth, small businesses, uh, small and medium tourism enterprises, SMTEs, and this is not just a Caribbean phenomenon, it's, it's worldwide, uh, have yet to feel the full benefits of the tourism rebound. Uh, sadly, some of our social metrics are even moving in the opposite direction. But then tourism is booming, why should we care? For me, the reason is very clear. Our long-term success depends on deepening the linkages between tourism and the rest of our economy and society. True success should not only be measured in arrival numbers or tourism expenditure, 
but in how tourism fosters local entrepreneurship, lifts our Caribbean people out of poverty, and creates lasting social partnerships. In St. Lucia and around uh, the Caribbean, we've recognized that it can't be tourism business as usual. Our St. Lucia Hospitality and Tourism Association has been championing community tourism projects in areas that were previously seen as off limits to visitors with support from both public and private sector funding. Our recently revamped tourism incentive legislation now links investor incentives to social partnerships and local purchases. These initiatives are vital for a sustainable future and are not and are happening around the Caribbean. One of my key focuses at CHDA under my presidency will be the launch of a linkages task force to map and enhance these best practices across the region. Our sustainability and resilience are tied to a peaceful coexistence and codependence on other sectors and our communities. We're in a world now where technology and artificial intelligence can replicate almost anything. But in such a world, our authentic, holistic Caribbean product remains irreplaceable. I'm grateful for the opportunity to give you some brief remarks today and to address you. We've clearly proven that our tourism product can be resilient. Now, as we look forward towards a peaceful future, we must make the investments necessary now for a sustainable recovery, both for our businesses in all sectors, not just tourism, and our communities. As the voice of the Caribbean hospitality private sector, the CHDA is here for the long haul, and we look forward to partnering with others to make this vision a reality. I thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Destan, for your valuable insights. <clears throat> your emphasis on partnership is key to our success uh, in fostering a resilient tourism sector. You spoke about women, youth, and the long-term success in terms of lasting social relationships and partnerships. Uh, I, I love your plan as well with, with creating those linkages and that linkage task force. Um, sustainability, again, was at the, the heart of your, your delivery, you know, and the need for a sustainable approach to developing resilient products in the region. So thank you so much again for your, your message. At this moment, we will pause for a special video presentation from the UN Tourism. Let's take a moment to reflect on their important message. Happy World Tourism Day. As we mark World Tourism Day this year, our planet is revenged by war and insecurity. Around one in four of the global population now lives in areas of conflict. Many of us have first-hand experience of the suffering caused by war, and the impacts are felt far outside of war zones. We must urgently stand up for peace. The global tourist family is brought to diverse and diverse, but what unites us is our shared humanity. Ours is the most human sector. Every journey leads to a connection. Tourism brings world together and closer. Tourism builds trust and respect. It lays the foundations for cooperation and it drives inclusive growth and prosperity, the SARS safeguards against conflict. We need these values now more than ever. They underscore every part of UN tourism mission and our of work. Our focus on education brings young people from different countries and cultures together, and it creates opportunities for them to find work and meaning. Our work in tourism for rural development means that nobody is left behind and the economies grow equally and fairly. And our passion for innovation presents new ways which we can connect and collaborate. Working side by side, we can ensure a brighter tomorrow for all. Let us take this occasion to set the tone for future generations. Let us recommit to multilateralism, respect for international law and the values of the United Nations. Above all, let us work together as a sector united to make tourism a beacon of hope and ensure that when peace does return to areas of conflict, we are ready to help people rebuild and reconnect. Wherever you are and however you are celebrating, 
on this World Tourism Day. I wish you all peace and prosperity. So thank you to UN Tourism for that presentation, which reinforces the significance of our collective efforts in promoting tourism for peace. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our feature speaker for today, Mr. Timothy Marshall. <coughs> Sorry. The chairman of the International Institute for Peace through tourism. His work in this field has been transformative and we are eager to hear his insights. Mr. Marshall has been an inspiration and has achieved a lot during his career. Some of his highlights, uh, he served as former president and CEO of the National Economic Development Pilot Program and this was replicated in 16 major US markets. <coughs> Sorry. He chaired the Global Trade Summits at JFK Airport and Washington DC Convention Center. He addressed the IIPT Global Summits at the United Nations International Conference Center in Genoa, in Geneva, Switzerland, sorry, in Jordan, Johannesburg, Thailand, and Zambia. He was the founding National Advisory Board with Maya Angelou Center for Health Equity. He was also involved with uh, founding the National Governing Board with the US Department of Treasury designated CDE. And of course, uh, founding Vice Chairman, Community Development Corporation, where he established nearly 400 housing units. He was named to Economic Development Advisory Boards, Commissions and Task Force by the President of the California State Senate, Mayor of New York City, Governor of New York, and the private sector. Inaugural, he was an inaugural national fellow <clears> of <throat> the Walt, Walter Kites Foundation, HSBC Chairman's Award as well. And he led in naming the IIPT Maya Angelou International Peace Park at Victoria Falls in Zambia. And of course, he received the national, many national, state, and local awards, proclamations, and citations. Please let us warmly welcome our feature speaker, Mr. Timothy Marshall. Hi, Mr. Marshall. Um, can you start again? You were muted. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of our founder and president emeritus, Dr. Luda Moore, our newly elected president, Mr. Ajay Prakash, and our entire global family, I would like to thank Mr. Ron Gulam and the leadership of the Caribbean Tourism Organization for the opportunity to speak with you. My topic today is the urgent imperative for peace through tourism. And I would like to begin by sharing a few lines from a poem by Dr. Maya Angelou, which she read at the 50th anniversary of the United Nations in 1995. It is entitled, A Brave and Startling Truth. When we come to it, when we let the rifles fall from our shoulders and children dress their dolls in flags of truce, when landmines of death have been removed and the aged can walk into evenings of peace, when religious ritual is not perfumed by the incense of burning flesh and childhood dreams are not kicked awake by nightmares of abuse. When we come to it, we, this people, on this wayward floating body, created on this earth, of this earth, have the power to fashion for this earth, a climate where every man and every woman 
can live freely without sanctimonious piety, without crippling fear. When we come to it, we must confess that we are the possible. We are the miraculous, the true wonder of this world. That is when and only when we come to it. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come together at a time when the world is facing serious conflicts across the globe. And although the particularities are different, there were major conflicts emerging in 1986, the year the Institute was founded. Our vision was and is to make travel and tourism the world's first global peace industry. Our belief is that every traveler is potentially an ambassador for peace. And our mission is to foster initiatives that contribute to international understanding, cooperation among nations, improved quality of the environment, cultural enhancement and preservation of heritage, reconciliation and healing wounds of conflict, and through these initiatives, help to bring about a peaceful and sustainable world. These are the core principles that guide our work. And I would like to share three underlying values that guide these principles. First, peace with God. Next, peace with each other. And finally, peace with nature. As a creator and global leader of the Peace Through Tourism movement, IPT launched its first global conference on sustainable tourism development in Vancouver in 1988. Our theme was tourism, a vital force for peace. There, we introduced a new paradigm and higher purpose for tourism, that is advancing global peace. Today, we hear this concept being espoused all over the globe. However, nearly 40 years ago, when the Institute was founded, the industry's focus was almost exclusively on economics and finance, and these concepts were very forward. Approximately six months after our first global conference, the first Caribbean conference on socially and environmentally responsible tourism was held in 1989 in the Bahamas and featured Dr. Damore, along with Mr. Stanley Selengut, who established the first Caribbean ecotourism resort based in St. John, U.S. Virgin Island. This led to two subsequent conferences on ecotourism in the Caribbean and a major new focus on sustainable tourism by the CTO. This initiative was spearheaded by one of our board members, Mr. Mark Lee Wilson. It also led to the establishment of the Institute's first Caribbean chapter under the direction of Ms. Diana McIntyre Pike. Among other accomplishments, 19 Jamaican and Caribbean villages were declared as IPT Skoll Peace Villages on the opening day of the UNWTO General Assembly in 2013. Each village committed themselves to promoting the Institute's values and principles. The Caribbean chapter also launched the Manchester Peace Coalition in Jamaica and has dedicated 18 peace parks. Now, with that background, let's take a look at our first value, peace with God. IBT has played a leading role in spirituality and tourism from a major conference at the site of St. Francis of Assisi's work in Italy, to sacred Himalaya travel and treks in Bhutan, to dedicating a global peace park at Bethany beyond the Jordan, the site of Christ's baptism in the Middle East, to the dedication of a global peace park in Uganda, where record crowds flocked for the 50th anniversary of the canonization of 32 Christian martyrs who were burned to death for their refusal to denounce Christianity. The Uganda Martyrs Trail was dedicated as a legacy of IPT's fourth African conference and has become a major event on the global Catholic calendar. IPT has facilitated interfaith dialogues with eight different religions attending one of our events at the same time. And it demonstrated that our similar similarities are much greater than our differences. Now, our second value is peace with each other. This has been the core of our work and it's impossible to do this area justice, but I will try to share a brief synopsis of some of them. For example, 
IPT's global summits have brought together royalty, heads of state, top UN officials, Nobel laureates, and heads of major industry organizations. We've also hosted prominent travel and tourism executives like Mr. Bill Marriott and Mr. Harvey Golub, then chairman of American Express and chairman of WTTC. Over the years, we've assembled a wonderful network of industry strategic partners like PADA and the African Travel Association who signed an historic MOU at our summit in Thailand in 2005. This MOU promoted travel between the African and Asian continents. And one of our closest partners, Skoll International, has joined forces with us to establish peace cities and towns and wonderful places around the world. Now, under the principle of healing wounds of conflict, one of our board members led an IPT initiative to provide educational and social services for 160 Syrian refugee children who along with their families fled the conflict in Syria to Azraq, Jordan. This special project is one way that we try to make a tangible impact in the lives of people who are hurting. Now on our 25th anniversary celebration at the World Travel Market in London, that event was in support of the 100th anniversary of World War I, which was called, quote, the Great War. Our theme was War No More. Croatia marked our 25th anniversary with a 25 city bike tour. This peace tour went from Croatia to Bosnia and Herzegovina, two major war-torn countries, and ended with a beautiful, prayer service, a prayer for peace among all of the participants. And this touched our hearts. This was a very special example because it incorporated two of our core values, peace with God and peace with each other. As we all know, the world is witnessing the horrible tragedy that war, conflict, and a devastating famine has brought to Sudan. And needless to say, Tourists will not be able to experience Sudan's rich historic treasures for some time. This is a concrete example of why peace is so critical to tourism. The same can be said for the war in Ukraine, the conflict in Gaza and the emerging conflict in Lebanon, as well as many other parts of our global community. IPT's work in peace and reconciliation was featured when the Olympics Truth Campaign was launched at the 2016 Olympics in Rio and during the UNWTO conference in Sri Lanka, which had been a war zone for 30 years prior to the event. Today, however, it is an example of how people who have been affected by conflict have picked up the pieces and rebuilt their lives. This conference would not have taken place nor would the significant economic benefits have been realized for their people if there was no peace. Now, in 2015, the Institute honored three great men of peace, posthumously, President Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at our global symposium in South Africa. It's important to note that this symposium was held at Emperor's Palace, which was the site where the transfer of power actually took place after the apartheid, after the end of apartheid. This was 21 years after Mr. Mandela assumed the presidency and the families of these great men and the government of India accepted the awards on their behalf. The Institute has also been involved in a broad range of issues, including the violence in the war in Ukraine, sexual violence against women, the impact of war on children, and so many other topics. Now, finally, our third value, peace with nature. Now this can be seen in almost everything we've done, but can most directly be seen through the dedication of over 450 global peace parks around the world. This initiative was launched in Canada with 350 peace parks across Canada on the occasion of its 125th anniversary. Some of our most notable peace parks include Victoria Falls, a World Heritage Site and one of the seven wonders of the world, which is located on the border of Zambia and Zimbabwe. 
Then there is a major global peace park at the renowned Pure National Park in China. Along with the dedication of a global town of peace in the Danzai Wanda village of China, which is an international tourism destination that is dedicated to poverty reduction. And there is a peace park at the United Nations International Conference Center in Geneva, Switzerland that we dedicated after our global summit there. A final example is our International Peace Park in Medellin, Colombia, which was dedicated during the UNWTO General Assembly. This was very significant given Medellin's history as a notorious place of violence and having once been dubbed the murder capital of the world. Now, perhaps one of our most significant initiatives regarding peace with nature was the hosting of one of the world's earliest global summits on climate change in Lusaka, Zambia in 2011. This summit brought together top thought leaders and practitioners and led to the adoption of the Lusaka Declaration, which is housed at the United Nations. We were honored to have Zambia's founding president, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, as our patron and special guest. The summit find findings have been published by Cambridge Scholars Publishers. Now, in the dedication of our peace park at Victoria Falls, Mr. Ben Sherman, chairman of the World Indigenous Tourism Alliance, noted that for centuries, indigenous people have understood the basic principle of reciprocity with nature. That, that Mother Earth gives, and it is our responsibility to take care, to take care of the Earth. Through our Global Peace Parks Initiative, thousands of trees have been planted around the world. And it is our hope that this will make at least a small contribution to reversing the damage of climate change. I know I've tried to pack a lot in, but I would like to conclude with what we called our credo of the peaceful travel. And it reads, grateful for the opportunity to travel and, tr and experience the world. And because peace begins with the individual, I affirm my personal responsibility and commitment to journey with an open mind and heart, accept with grace and gratitude the diversity I encounter, revere and protect the natural environment which sustains all life, appreciate all cultures I discover, respect and thank my hosts for their welcome, offer my hand in friendship to everyone I meet, support travel services that share these views and act upon them, and by my spirit, words, and actions, encourage others to travel the world in peace. This is what we've dedicated ourselves to, and that is our hope for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Marshall, for your compelling address your vision for tourism as a vehicle for peace and understanding is both inspiring and it is essential, you know, and some of the takeaways <clears throat> uh, out of your speech, you know, uh, we, you spoke about peace with God, peace with people, and of course, nature, those three pillars you spoke about. And of course, you spoke about the industry, you spoke about your organization and, and the good work that your organization has been doing leading up to a lot of peaceful and peace relations and so on. And one line that stood out to me uh, in your, your presentation was one at the beginning where you spoke about every traveler is an ambassador for peace. You know, I absolutely lo love that statement, you know. So <clears throat> thank you again, Mr. Marshall. Now, uh, I would invite, I would like to invite all our esteemed uh, speakers we've had so far, our moderators who will be moderating the sessions, and of course, our panelists to join me for an official virtual photo. Let's capture this moment as a testament to our commitment to building a peaceful future through tourism. All right, so please uh, turn your cameras on <clears throat> and let's capture that photo. Donna, are you there? Can you turn on your camera? Yes, I'm here. My camera's on. Hi, Kiana. I was asking about Donna, the SG. Kiana, your, your camera was on. Yes, I'm here. Can you see me? Yes, I can see you. Okay. 
you just turned it off. Hi, Sharon. I'm I'm here. I'm turning on in a minute. Okay. All righty, I will give everyone the cue to say cheese or peace, whichever works for you. Okay, say cheese or peace. 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 All right, let me just take a second one. It's always good to have a backup. Okay, say peace, everyone. Happy Friday. Peace. 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 Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Sharon Coward, for uh, doing the, the photo. All right. So now that we have uh, gotten the photo done, let me just give an overview with regards to today's proceedings, uh, you know, our forum, Resilience and Renewal, Building a Peaceful Future. The event will kick off with an introductory session by the moderator of the first panel, and that's Miss Christine Young, followed by a session entitled uh, Strengthening Foundations, Navigating Crisis with Resilience and Peace. <clears throat> this segment will delve into how peace building principles can enhance crisis response featuring insights from the Ministry of Tourism of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Grenada Tourism Authority on Hurricane Beryl's impact. The discussions will continue with a panel on harmonious renewal using regenerative tourism to foster peace and prosperity. And this will be moderated by Dr. Leslie and Jordan Miller, showcasing various initiatives in voluntourism and gender equity the day will also highlight a youth perspective on uh, Caribbean tourism, uh, and that will be from uh, the Caribbean Tourism Youth Congress winner, that's Miss Kiana Warner, right? This forum will then conclude with a summary of the outcomes and then a vote of thanks. Now, please remember <clears throat> to type your questions and so on that you have for the, the panelists and the, the moderators, you know, will then direct them to the panelists uh, per respective sessions, all right? So <clears throat> let us begin. So as we move forward, I'm excited to introduce our first panel discussion titled Strengthening Foundations, Navigating Crisis with Resilience and Peace. This session will explore how we can integrate peace building principles into our crisis response and recovery efforts. I'm pleased to welcome our moderator for this session, Ms. Christine Young, who is the Managing Director of Green Caribbean Consulting. Ms. Young, please take the stage. The floor is yours. Thank you, Narendra. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. I'm very excited to be here this morning. In the essence of time, I will start with the introduction of our first speaker. And our first speaker is Ms. Phelan King, who is the Director of Tourism for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And Ms. King is going to do a, a presentation for us on the effects of Hurricane Barrel, the impacts and the key learnings. So we welcome Ms. Phelan King. Good morning and thank you and happy World Tourism Day to all who have joined today. Its forum. In keeping with the theme for World Tourism Day, I hope that my presentation would underscore above all the inherent connection between tourism and the peace. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we recognize that this connection with industry partners locally, regionally, and internationally have been at the core of our, of our recovery of specific challenges during this period. On Monday, July 1st, 2024, St. Vincent and the Grenadines was heavily impacted by the passage of Hurricane Burial, which brought significant rainfall and heavy winds to our islands, more specifically, the Grenadine Islands. In an address to the nation that evening, Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Ralph Gonzalez said, reports indicated that 
Union Island in particular had been devastated with 90% of houses either severely damaged or destroyed. The Prime Minister said similar levels of devastation were expected for the islands of Miro and Canawan. This was confirmed when assessments commenced in the upcoming days. The Argyle International Airport on St. Vincent, as well as the airports in the Grenadines, namely Beckway, Mustique, Canawan and Union Island, were forced to temporarily close. While the Argyle International Airport reopened within two days, and those on Beckway, Mustique, and Canwan subsequently reopened, the Union Island Airport re remains closed, except, of course, for emergency operations. Ferry services suffered minimal disruptions and have remained the main mode of transportation between the islands since July. Young Island, the closest island to St. Vincent, suffered the loss of its jetties and ferries, and as such, this posed the significant challenges in accessing that island. The resort reopened at the end of August following extensive renovation. Palm Island and Petit St. Vincent, however, suffered severe destruction and remain closed to date. The forced closure of, of three island resorts undoubtedly posed challenges in relation to visitor arrivals and by extension, tourism expenditure and employment. Utility companies worked feverishly to restore full services throughout the country. To date, these services have been re restored throughout the islands with the exception of portions of the Grenadines, the Southern Grenadines, I should say, where specific work continues on restorating our on restorative work, sorry, continues by our local utility companies with the aid of their regional counterparts. In the days ahead of the hurricane, local tourism officials were in contact with service providers throughout the destination to ascertain the status of guests and infrastructure. This included ascertaining guest counts and their evacuation plans. However, Limited telecommunication service in the immediate aftermath posed another critical challenge to the follow-up effort. The lessons that we learned. The biggest lesson learned from the passage of Hurricane Beryl was that no level of disaster preparedness could fully prepare any tourism destination for the impact that our tourism sector suffered in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. At this juncture, I wish to commend the work of our National Emergency Management Organization and our National Emergency Response Council that is comprised of representatives from key public and private sector bodies, including the Ministry of Tourism. Led by our permanent secretary in the Ministry of Tourism, the tourism team has used the lessons and systems learned during and after the eruption of our last volcano in 2021 to provide immediate assistance to displaced Vincentians as well as visitors. The ongoing work of the Ministry of Tourism and the Tourism Authority since July 1st has primarily been in identifying, assessing and providing suitable temporary accommodation for families who lost their homes. Work continues with partner ministries to transfer, transfer families from government shelters to suitable and available tourism accommodation and private homes. The experience during the volcanic eruption was slightly different, however, as more tourism accommodations were available due to the low levels of occupancy in April 2021 and the ensuing months as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our best practices. There are innumerable best practices that I can highlight in the wake of Hurricane Beryl, but I will highlight a few that are specifically related to tourism networking and tourism corporate social responsibility. I highly commend the CTO's communication strategies before, during, and after the storm, inclusive of updates on social media and via the CTO communications community. 
These greatly assisted us in providing updates to the wider world. A special thank you to our SG Regis Prosper, who checked in at every possible opportunity to ascertain how our staff and stakeholders were faring. It would be remiss of me if I also did not single out my colleagues and I dare say friends, Amanda Charles and Kennedy Pemberton, who journeyed to and through St. Vincent and the Grenadines from July 12th to 20th to conduct the tourism impact assessment. They braved rough seas, rocky roads, and ravaged terrains of our islands and provided a con at the end a comprehensive report on their findings that we have welcomed as an invaluable resource in this recovery period. The exercise also served as a teaching learning tool for those of us who had the privilege of accompanying them during that assessment exercise. We are eternally grateful for the technical and moral assistance. Royal Caribbean Cruise Line readily made an on-schedule call to our destination on July 6th to deliver disaster relief supplies. Special mention must be made of Mrs. Wendy McDonnell, Regional Vice President of Government Relations for her, for her role in making this a reality. Palm Island Resort continues to assist with the recovery response by among other initiatives, giving their employees a supplementary sum of money for a three month period, whether or not they chose to remain employed. The Palm Island Resort also continues to work with the government and NGOs to provide relief in the form of transportation, tools and water tanks, particularly on Union Island. The Petty St. Vincent Resort continues to match funding in donations from friends and guests of PSV to achieve a total goal of $550,000 that will provide essential aid and support to communities most affected by Hurricane Barrel. Similarly, tourism investors and benefactors on Can One have contributed significant sums that have resulted in expedited work on the airport and other infrastructure on that island. Our comprehensive registry of tourism approved services and service providers compiled by the SVG Tourism Authority was critical in assisting us to contact particularly tourism accommodations, taxi operators, land and marine tourism operators and tour guides. Our standards and codes of practice have been have proven to be beneficial, particularly to service providers in relation to critical re requirements such as insurance policies and their disaster response plans. And finally, the one that is probably closest to me in the Ministry of Tourism, our established tourism incentives remain available for tourism stakeholders who have suffered losses. Tourism stakeholders continue to apply for and receive concessions in their rebuilding and recovery efforts. As I conclude, I wish to thank the CTO and more specifically Narendra and Amanda for this invitation to present. And I trust that I have provided some perspective on St. Vincent and the Grenadines' crisis management strategies and our best practices that can possibly help to enhance our regional disaster preparedness and resilience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. King, for that presentation. And uh, definitely it is, it is heartwarming to see the amount of unity that was created. Thank you for in reinforcing the fact that tourism can be used as a, as a vehicle for sustainability and also resilience. And especially for the small islands, that is particularly important. It's, it's heartwarming that everyone banded together and to see how the disasters brought together communities, private sector, public sector, nonprofits, and also stakeholders with varying interests. So we definitely had all hands on deck for the recovery process. Thank you to all of the players that continue to play a role in the recovery of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We now welcome our next speaker, who is the Honorable Minister Adrian A. Thomas, uh, the Minister of Tourism for the, great, the Creative Economy and Culture in Grenada. And his presentation will be by the 
Grenada Tourism Authority on Hurricane Barrel's impact and also the key learnings. Honorable Minister, we welcome you. Minister Thomas. Hello. Good. Hello? Yes, good morning. <laughs> okay. Right. Speak I just want to, I just tried to share the screen there with you. Wrong. Lovely. Good morning, all. Everybody's hearing me? Yes, Minister, we can hear you. Thank you so very much. And good morning to everybody. Um, protocol already been established. Um, first of all, let me congratulate the CTO for organizing such a very important meeting. And obviously for inviting me to make this presentation. Um, in keeping with the theme for World Tourism Day, let me also congratulate everybody and wish them a happy World Tourism Day. The theme, Tourism and Peace. Um, it's a very important theme in the world today and I, I know definitely that tourism can carry, they can carry peace throughout the world as they UN Secretary General said, um, everybody that travel the world is an ambassador for peace. Um, today's presentation, I'll be looking at the impact of um, Hurricane Beryl and the key learning that came from it. Um, we have four areas I would like to, four objectives I would like to. Pardon give. me, Mr. Minister Thomas, pardon me. Um, would you be able to hit the presentation mode, please, for the for the presentation? I think it is it's on our screen. It's a little bit small. It's a it's small. So if you hit okay. the present okay. the yes, the presentation mode, please. Fantastic. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Lovely. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing it now? It's uh no, it's not. It's not in full screen as yet. Screen. Just hit the full screen so that it is in presentation mode. Hi, Mr. Minister. Or you if can you... click on slideshow and then start from the beginning. If you click on slideshow next between animations and record at the top. Okay, just give me a... Oh, you have help. Okay, great. Right, okay. Just give me a minute. Sure, no problem. Stop share. Stop share. Right. Go to your screen. Screen share. Screen share. Yes. So let's share. Let's share this one. So I did the... You can then click on slideshow at the top between animations and record. Click on slideshow at the top. Good to go? Yeah. So that we can see the full presentation, if you can click on slideshow at the top. Oh, Minister, I also have your presentation if you'd like me to share it.
Okay, um, I will have to make a request. Okay. Special request. You, you, you all will have to put it up for me, please. Yes, I'm sharing it now, Minister Thomas. Okay. This is uh, this is the one that was sent to me, yes. Stop. Is that okay? Um, I'm not seeing it now. Screen freeze or something. Can everyone else see it? Let me try sharing it again. I'm not seeing it as yet. Yes? Is this nice. better, Minister? So go from the top. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Sorry for the delay. <laughs> right. So I will continue now. Yes, Minister, you can continue. Yes. Right. So I was on the second slide. Right. We for the four main objectives we'll be looking at today is the introduction and situational analysis, the challenges faced, and the lessons learned. Um, and finally, the last topic will be the best practices moving forward. Next slide. Well, as we all as we all know, um, natural disaster has become frequent and and very intense. Um, we do not know when they are coming and how they are coming, but they are they cause significant challenges for the community, the economy, and most importantly, the tourism sector, which many of us in the Caribbean depends on. Next slide. Um, on the first of July, twenty twenty four, uh, Grenada, Caracol, and Pitti Martinique, we experienced a Category Four hurricane in the form in by the name of Beryl. Um, carrying winds as much as 150 miles per hour. Um, it's in Caracol and Pitti Mantinic, over 98% of the infrastructure was damaged. Um, the housing stock was totally, I mean, I mean, it was devastating. And the little agriculture that was there was also badly affected. Um, the tourism industry, in particular in, in, in Caracol and Pitti Mantinic, was highly devastated. Um, in Grenada, the 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 mainland we just had the northern part of the island where over four hundred houses in in it was uh, was was damaged, and the but the agricultural sector on the mainland with with our main crops, um, nutmeg and and cocoa, um, about ninety percent of the crops in in the not in the northern part of the islands was totally damaged, and just to make the point here that most of the nutmeg plants that was damaged were plants that were um, rehabilitated and planted just after Hurricane Ivan 20 years ago. So those plants, maybe they just reached the peak production um, because although the nutmeg plant will take um, three years to, to start um, producing, um, we we don't get maximum production from nut, from the nutmeg until about 12, 15 years. So it's a great setback for the people in, in the northern part of, of, of our mainland. And also, we did experience uh, three fatalities, um, two in Caracol and one in Grenada. And that figure could have been much higher if we did not take the, um, the put the necessary measures in place um, just before the hurricane to establish and, 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 and run shelters so that people can shelter themselves. Um, in, in, in Grenada in particular, many people went to the shelters and therefore that was um, the main reason for the um, small figure. We have three fa fa fatalities, even though it's um, three is, is, is quite a bit, but we, we are grateful for this. Next slide. Um, some of the challenges that we face, um, obviously, as I said, um, Caracol ninety eight percent damage to the infrastructure was. I mean, there was no house in in Caracol with electricity. All the the all the electricity was down. Um, the roads were badly damaged. Um, vehicles couldn't travel. M many of the people on the on the island um would have had the vehicles parked outside. With with and they were not being able to use for months in regards to the level of damage that they had, um in Caracol and in the northern part of Grenada, many people lost their livelihoods, 
um, especially in the agricultural sector in, in Grenada. And um, the government has um, put quite a few measures in place to see if we can get people back up and running. Um, communication and and coordination issues it was a serious problem. We could not have communicated to the people in Caracol for maybe for the first two, two weeks. Um, we are getting there sooner than later. Next slide. Um, obviously, it, um, Carico, in, in Carico and Piti Martinic, tourism is, is growing steadfastly. And obviously, the, the few destinations that we had there, they have been damaged significantly. Um, there was no vegetation in Carico for the maybe for the first um, month and a half. Um, the vegetation with the little rain that we are getting is getting back, is getting back and up and running now. Um, Decline in the economies of Karaku and Piti Martinique fueled by the tourism industry. Obviously, there are quite a few um, guest houses, there are hotels. Um, there are lot, most of the beaches that that the visitors would have used was damaged, and a lot of a lot of cleaning up have to be taking place there at this point in time. Um, most importantly, is the uh, psychological and emotional impact on the host population. Um, people were traumatized traumatized and um, they, a lot of people still are being, being affected and cannot get back on the feet as yet. But the government is doing, the Ministry of Education is doing quite a lot to get the schools back up and running. By the end of this week, well, Monday, um, schools should be opening. The, we are planning to pay a visit there Monday morning. Most of the ministers are really planning to make a visit there to just to improve the moral support of the, the not only school children, but the teachers, the parents, and the communities. Next slide, please. Uh, what are the lessons learned? Preparedness is key. You've got, you got to be proactive in terms of disaster planning. Um, you got to you got to make sure that the people get the information, the people are cooperating, and the people are, they know exactly what to do. And this can only come from the administration. It can only come from the leadership in the country. Um, diversification of the tourism economy by having a wider range of tourism offering. Um, this cannot be overemphasized. It is, it is It was very important that Grenada, the mainland, did not get the kind of damage that Caracol and Piti Matnik got so that Grenada was being used and, 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 use as the 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 port that could would get the, the stuff from the international community the regional community and obviously channel it to Caracol and Piti Matic. so this was a plus had both islands or, or the mainland and the our sisters and brothers in the in the other islands um if all of us were in the same boat or got the same level of damage it would have been very much more challenging so diversification is very key and while the tourism sites and destinations in Caracol and Piti Martinique are badly affected. Grenada in itself is up and running, and we are quite grateful for that. Um, effective management requires collaboration across the sector. Um, we have been meeting with the hotelers. We have been meeting with the taxi associate, association, the restaurants, the people involved in the tourism, tourism sector. Um, which is so key in terms of getting ourselves back up and running. And this we have been able to do quite successfully and nicely. Next slide. Um, activating your communication and public relations plans before, during, and after a crisis or disaster is key. Um, that in itself, as a second bullet point here, will say that the, it says that the Prime Minister, Dick Mitchell, proactive role in managing the disaster re resulted in swift decision making. And this was so important. From the time we won Hurricane Watch, the, the Prime Minister was in the engine room um, working closely with NAGMA or the, the, disaster, the disaster Management Organization Agency. Um, he was there during the storm. He was there after the storm. And for the first couple of weeks, he was in every press conference, um, talking to the people, communicating with them. This was so important. And this is in going forward, we believe this will be the right approach to really take. Next slide. And here you can see him in the in the in the field. This is in this is in Cargo. A couple of days, um, cut, maybe the second day after the hurricane passed, he was on the ground already. Um, he took from the beginning. He took charge and joined. And after the hurricane, um, we have the national 
Disaster Management Agency, um, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency was also at hand with us, um, assisting us and encouraging us and giving us the moral support. Um, CAFA was also on board and we had the regional um, security system in um, accompanying us in all in, in all of this. Next slide. The best practice. Um, first of all, we we strengthen early warnings. We must put systems in place whereby we can take charge. Um, when it, we have we 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 have the system in Grenada where we can read, um, and we can gather information from the material. Meteorological Center in in and Point Selling Airport, uh, where they can give us information timely, and therefore we can put systems in place. Um, in going forward, building climate building climate resilient infrastructure will be crucial. Um, I people are encouraging us that um, the fact that ninety eight percent of the infrastructure in Caribou and Piti Martinique was done, it might be the ideal time to um, start talking about um, putting our infrastructure on the ground. Um, rather than on pools in the air. So all those things are in going forward, we might be, we, we will be thinking of um, building climate resilient infrastructure, promoting regional collaboration, so important because we are so close to each other. It is important that we collaborate with each other and um, we may not need, we may not, it may not, it might not be necessary to repeat some of the things that we, um, that we are doing. We can learn from our neighbors and so, and put systems in place that we can where, where we can mitigate the damages. Um, meet with your stakeholders immediately um, to discuss concerns and, and suggestions and have communication plan in place to get your message out as early as possible. Next slide. Uh, well, despite the, the despite the difficulties we had with with burial, you can see from the figures here in July, um, and basically that's on the mainland. Um, the, there was an increase of five point three percent in July, um, compared to twenty twenty three to twenty twenty four, and in August we we when which was our festive season our carnival, we had an increase of twelve twelve point three despite the 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 hurricane. Next slide. Well, in concluding, um, Hurricane Beryl's impact was a wake-up call, reminding us of the vulnerability we face uh, as a small island nation in the Caribbean. However, it also provided us with an opportunity to learn, adapt, and build resilience. Um, we cannot always predict when and where the next hurricane will strike, but we can we can do, but we can be better prepared, and. By investing in sustainable tourism, fostering community resilience, and enhancing our crisis management strategy, we can ensure that tourism not only recovers from natural disaster, but emerges stronger, serving as a pillar for peace, unity, and prosperity. And next slide. Right, so I will just, please bear with me, I'll just play a little clip here from, for you in terms of what we did soon after the hurricane. So let's play, taking the video. You gotta click on it so they could play. Is everyone getting the audio or no? I'm not getting it. The audio is coming through? No. No? All right, let me stop and share it again. One moment. Hi, Christine, I can share the audio on my end. I can share the audio on my end. Okay. Creative economy and culture. Fraternal greetings. As Minister for Tourism, the Creative Economy and Culture in Grenada, I take this opportunity 
to address our visitors and partners about the status of the tourism infrastructure post-hurricane burial. While we are thankful that mainland Grenada escaped the worst of the hurricane, we are saddened that our farmers, especially those to the northeastern side of the country, and our sister islands of Karakou and Pitimatnik, took the brunt and was severely impacted. As always, the safety, security, and well-being of our citizens and visitors are our top priorities. We have conducted a rapid assessment on the status of the tourism infrastructure in Grenada. And I am pleased to inform you that all critical infrastructure, including hotels, resorts, guest houses, transportation networks, tourist attractions, and all ports of entry are opened for business. The Morris Bishop International Airport continues to welcome all scheduled flights, and hundreds of visitors and returning nationals are arriving daily. Crews, yachting, and docking facilities were not impacted and remains functional. The government of Grenada continues to mobilize resources to support our farmers in Grenada and the citizens of Karakou and Pitimatnik. Additionally, we are working closely with local communities, stakeholders, and international partners and countries to ensure that their recovery is inclusive and sustainable. While the road to recovery will be challenging, I am confident in our ability to overcome and strive. Our spirit is unbreakable, and our commitment to providing a safe, welcoming, and vibrant destination for visitors remains steadfast. Thank you for your continued support and we look forward to welcoming you for our annual Carnival Festival, properly known as Spice Mass in August. Thank you. That's the slide. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister Thomas. Uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, this was indeed a, an excellent presentation, and we thank you for sharing with us the challenges that you faced uh, with Hurricane Barrel and also the lessons learned. It was definitely very heartwarming, again, to see the, the level of stakeholder engagement that was involved in the process, and um, especially that you had involved the stakeholders before, during, and also after you know, the disaster event and definitely that would have promoted increased communication and peace and understanding. And we really sometimes underestimate how we can band together when we are faced with uh, natural disasters and also any extreme circumstances. So we thank you for that, Minister Thomas. Uh, especially, I also liked that you have included in the uh, recovery efforts that uh, the psychological effects, because oftentimes we may underestimate the, you know, the psychological effects of natural disasters. So it is commendable that your government is also uh, continuing to focus on that. So we thank you. And in essence of time, again, we are now going on to our next speaker. And we have with us Mr. John Biles, who is the Executive Deputy Chairman of Chaka. And Mr. Biles will be presenting for us on peace through preparedness, navigating the twin pillars of crisis communications and crisis management. Mr. Biles, we welcome you. Thank you, Christine, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, uh, you know, my my um, presentation today is peace through preparedness and. Um, and you know the importance of communication and and um, crisis management. Um, with the speakers that we have here, I am the the lesser of the communicators with our honourable ministers um, that are here. But I will approach it from the perspective of providing um, to the eyes of 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 you know Choco, our business. Um, which is in six different countries in the Caribbean, um, as well as some experience I've had with the COVID and the, um, the COVID management, COVID resilient corridor, 
as well as in Beryl through the Destination Assurance Council. So hopefully I'll be able to give you some, um, I would say, different perspectives from what is the usual channels. So tourism and crisis, um, we hope they never come together, but they do um, from time to time. So tourism as we know it is a social, cultural and economic phenomenon that's growing, is resilient and meaningful to our Caribbean nations. Um, I feel always that we have to be making that statement that we are resilient because too many out there speak as if we are a fickle industry. And we have demonstrated time and time again that we take the blows and we get up and we, we roll with it and, and we are always back up. Um, crisis management in the tourism sector refers to the strategic and proactive approach taken by the industry stakeholders to anticipate where we can, prepare for, respond to, and recover from unexpected events that may jeopardize the safety, travel plans, and overall visitor satisfaction. Uh, you know, we know this, this is, sometimes you wonder if you should put up what is, is, is you know, everybody knows, but there's a preparation, there's a crisis, there's a response and the recovery. And what it really is, is having a unified single purpose by the entire tourism sector and all who are the stakeholders involved in either the, the, the governance and or participating in the form of linkages. So understanding the tourism crisis landscape and just speaking here now, um, the resilient Caribbean tourism. And again, you're going to hear me say that again and again, because, you know, having gone through COVID, <clears throat> dealt with the banks and, and, and sometimes, um, you know, the non-tourism government um, that may not fully understand the, the full impact of tourism. You know, we always are speaking to, the, to what we are. Um, so we know that the world needs travel. It's a mega trend despite all, um, and, I, and it's been seen in the SCIF 2024 reports. Each Caribbean island is unique and we have a responsibility to deliver our unique sense of place. USA, which is our main market, and I believe generally for all of the Caribbean, delivered more passports to their citizens in 2023 than in history. And the emerging source markets are developing faster than ever. India now is one of the, the major source markets that, that's emerging. We have stable business, which is resorts, um, traditional resorts and um, and then we have the short-term rental, STR, which is the Airbnbs, et cetera, um, all airlift dependent. The cruise, the Caribbean is 40% of the global cruise representing the largest cruise destination. And we're growing fast with the inclusion of many of the, the larger ships that are coming there is going to be a faster growth in the Caribbean as far as packs than anywhere else. Um, you know, and then there, of course is domestic travel. I, I, you know, one of the points that we are seeing is that, and it, it's important, um, the minister before spoke about the importance of diversification and you know, when we see tourism, sometimes we only see it through certain lenses. But, you know, as, and, and you know, Chaka is, is one of the linkages. Um, and having been in the, in the, in the ministry of um, tourism, and in particular being asked to, to, to chair the Destination Assurance Council, um, you know, we know clearly that the attractions, restaurants, bars, 
um, craft vendors. And this is a whole social side of, of, of um, you know, the tourism. Um, we rely heavily on the cruise visitors coming to the Caribbean because they disproportionately spend out in the areas that we are in. And uh, we have found that the short-term rentals, um, Airbnbs are also following that buying behavior. So it, it's important that we see that, you know, where, where sometimes we may see shifts within the Caribbean, which do take place from time to time, and we all know this, you know, that there is this other side that will feed the, the craft, feed the, the, the um, attractions, and feed what is usually referred to as the, the, um, the, the you know, the smaller players in the market. Apologies, I'm having a little technical issue here, but okay, we're back in. The importance of preparedness. Being proactive in planning and communication can save lives, minimize damage, and allay anxiety of visitors due to being in an unfamiliar environment. With the uncertainty of the situation that travelers are prone to feeling, they're not at home. They don't know where their you know, pharmacies and you know, any of the, the, the areas that the comforts of home. So, you know, it's it's one of those areas or pain points that it's upon us in the tourism industry to manage and manage very well. Um, crisis can impact on tourism sector in many ways, such as the economic implications, which we've heard from the ministers in a, in a far more um, articulate manner, um, reputational risk. Uh, and, and I mentioned that because it's so important for us to do an evaluation after any crisis to let the world know that we're open. There are many times when, when forgive me, the, the, you know, the, the media will sensationalize at the expense of our destination's appeal. And it's important to be able to manage that narrative and make sure that after, and as, as soon after, that we can start attracting visitors that the world knows that we're back open again. Um, and then of course there are visitor safety concerns. So again, tourism is resilient. Putting crisis in perspective is always important in a tourism context because in the end, we are resilient and we not only survive but thrive. Um, you know, looking at Jamaica from 1995 to 2023, um, the visit trajectory shows it we are on a growth pattern. And that's throughout the Caribbean. Um, we've gone through 9-11, SARS, 2007 to 2009 economic recession, COVID. And, you know, we have a, a growing appreciation as a sector for the resilience being all for one and one for all. We are an ecosystem. That ecosystem has many players. And I, I will get into it a little bit more, but we know that we are collectively the guest experiences that the vacationer wants when they come to our destinations. And we are together accommodation, attractions, craft, and all the other aspects where we have a touch point with the guest are all part of the welcome and the and you know the 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 the, the warmth of the Caribbean why people come and keep coming. Now resilience and agility are born out of unwavering faith that we will get through. And that's always an important point because in the middle of, of crisis one of the issues that generally is out there is you know whether people are going to be coming back whether they are being left out the importance of communicating to our team members right that we will survive and then of course 
dealing with everyone else that's out there that are needed for us to survive. Um, it, it's, it's important that through it all, we know we will. And just looking at the history, it is proof of concept. Tourism is here to stay. The world needs travel and the world needs the Caribbean. The importance of crisis communications, just on a simple term, timely and accurate information reduces panic and confusion. Um, we see that in, 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 in all the cases. Um, managing public perception, the biggest reasons for chaos is not knowing. It's important uh, people know who to contact for accurate, relevant information and where to go in the case of no communication. Um, you know, there are going to be times when communication goes down completely. There needs to be for our visitors a very clear go-to plan and, 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 and how that's going to be, you know, managed so that when they come for the information or help, there, there is not somebody on the other side who doesn't know anything or that, you know, doesn't understand the, the importance of making that guest feel comfortable, that they are our visitor and that we care. Hurricanes. Uh, I spoke to you that Chaka has is in six countries. Well, one thing for sure is that hurricanes is muscle memory for us. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a part of what we do. And, and um, uh, as it does become for everyone else. But, you know, Minister Mitchell said it, it's important for us to learn collectively. Maybe those are my words. Um, in, you know, all the different countries. Because you don't want to learn the same thing twice. So it's better that we're learning from, 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 you know, from each other. And that's where CTO and CHTA are critical um, because it's, it's a conduit for sharing information that makes us all stronger. Um, tourism in our region is significantly impacted by hurricanes through physical damage to infrastructure, such as buildings, hotels, um, trails, in the case of attractions, landscape. Um, there's a decline there's also a decline in visitor numbers due to the travel disruptions and destination safety and or negative perception of vacations, ability to live up. We all know people are coming to us for the magic and they don't expect anything less, all of which result in lost revenue. Additionally, the recovery process can strain resources and affect local employment, whilst negative media coverage you know, can, can deter future tourists to the destination. The overall economic impact can be substantial, affecting a wide cross-section of lives and livelihoods. Communication in hurricane preparedness, learning from the best, nature. So communication, what do we know? What we do is inform industry of potential threats and the plans that you that comes through our government, um, you know the Met offices. Uh, we use multiple channels, including social media, and of course the 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 the, the um, credible social media has to get out there because there's a lot of social media that misdirects and misinforms, um, and of course on-site announcements. The proactive communication with guests and staff regarding potential impacts and safety measures. Utilizing backup systems for communication, satellite phones, two-way radios, um, you know, using multiple service providers in, in cases where, where, where you have that. Um, you know, we in the middle of um in Beryl, I'll say that you know, all of these um, communication providers are are supposed to have redundancies built in. They have, um, you know, they have these, these towers that have to be powered. If, if, if the power goes down, they have generators. 
And we found that many of the generators, the fuel had been stolen from them. And in some cases, you know, um, the generators themselves were stolen. Um, we know now for sure that the next time there's a hurricane, they need to be checking and ensuring that all this is in place. But we found that there were certain phones that worked in certain areas and other phones that didn't. Um, and as a company, we we went back to our two-way radios, and um, and and of course the satellite phones was something that the government had in all of the resort areas um, to help with the communication. Pardon me, Mr. Biles. We just have one more minute to wrap up in essence of time. Okay. Sure. Thank you. So, um, I will just state. Um, so. Through COVID, I will. I have never felt so proud of how we work together, um, and the collaboration was was like never before. Um, we have through that we now have a level of communication that is better than ever before, not just within the sector, but outside of the sector as well, and. Um, so I will close with this and I thank you for your time and I hope I was able to provide um, a level of perspective that maybe is different from what is usually brought forward. Thank you. Certainly, and thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mr. Biles, for that presentation highlighting how Chaka has taken some really powerful actions really towards promoting better communication and preparedness in the face of natural disasters. And also it's in keeping with the SDG goal number 16, which aims to promote peaceful and inclusive societies and to strengthen institutions. So we thank you for that presentation. We also take the opportunity now to thank all of the speakers uh, from, I think, the opportunity for my session um, for sharing their invaluable experiences with us this morning and we are sure that what was shared will not only inform our audience but also equip them with a new lens in which they can view tourism products and services as a catalyst to promote human relations inclusivity peace and increased unity uh, due to time constraints we will not be having the question and answer segment however your concerns we are sure you that your concerns will be addressed we are encouraging everyone to send an email to uh, Narendra Ramgulam and I will put the email address in the uh, chat box and Narendra I will now hand over to you. Thank you so much uh, Ms. Young and to, to all our panelists uh, Ms. Philine King, the Honorable Minister Thomas and, Ms., and Mr. John Biles for a rich and engaging discussion. Your insights are invaluable um, as we strive to build resilience in our tourism sector and we are so so grateful for all the examples that you would have shared. In the interest of time, um, we, as, as we said, we, we're just uh, going to cut the Q&A um, sections from both presentations, um, from both uh, pa uh, plenary um, discussions. And of course, you will send your, your emails in and we will then direct those questions and get you to responses later because we have a hard cutoff time at maybe 11, 11 11.05, 11 11.10. Um, so next, as we transition to our second session titled Harmonious Renewal, Using Regenerative Tourism to Foster Peace and Prosperity. This session highlights how sustainable tourism practices can contribute to peace and prosperity in our communities. I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for this session, Dr. Leslie Ann Jordan Miller. Dr. Jordan Miller is a senior lecturer in tourism and hospitality at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. And uh, Dr. Jordan Miller, the floor is all yours. Um, you know, please, uh, you know, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Narendra, and a pleasant good morning to everyone um, attending to these proceedings. I have learned so much from the first panel discussion, and I look forward to engaging with the next three panelists as we move on to talk about harmonious renewal using regenerative tourism to foster peace and prosperity and our three panelists will really emphasize how sustainable development, environmental stewardship and the protection of cultural and natural resources 
contribute to peace and prosperity. I know two of them personally, so I know that we're going to get really good information in this panel. So without any further ado, I would like to welcome Ms. Lorianne Pollard, and Lorianne currently serves as the Good Deeds Day Coordinator for Trinidad and Tobago, and she is going to share the role of volunteerism in fostering peace and community resilience. Lorianne. Good morning, everyone, and happy World Tourism Day. Thank you very, very much for the opportunity to speak to you about the role of volunteerism in fostering peace and community resilience. And I will be addressing you from the perspective of uh, from an NGO, the Volunteer Center of Trinidad and Tobago. So in the interest of time, and you can let me know if my, are you seeing my presentation? Yes, Lori. Okay, great. So um, uh, just to set the foundation, we have a definition of volunteerism on the screen. And I'll just pull out some of the keywords um, which would allow us to have a better understanding of the principles of volunteerism. Um, so conscious, voluntary service, travel and tourism, sustainable development, which we've been hearing a lot of this morning, and mutual benefit for the host community and the volunteer. So volunteer, volunteerism is simply dedicating time and energy skills while um, volunteers traveling to a country, sorry, to dedicate their time and energy and their skills while also gaining a firsthand experience of the country that they're visiting. So they're also able to do tourist at attractions and sites, et cetera. So to give further context of volunteerism, which has evolved over the years, it really started through the establishment of the Peace Corps in 1960s. And over the years, it became very commercialized because the um, NGOs and the travel agencies decided to partner to be able to package volunteer experiences, of course, for them to be able to um, gain a profit. And this kind of changed and adjusted the principles of the um, persons traveling to volunteer because, of course, these packages would have been attractive. and their primary goal might not have been to volunteer, but to really take up the opportunity for this um, cheaper means of getting to a country to vacation, um, and then would have, of course, been, been a part of volunteer activities. But it led to a lot of criticism about volunteerism as a term and a push for a lot of ethical practices um, in the 2010s, um, because there were a lot of concerns now around exploitation of vulnerable groups and you know the real intent of why these volunteers are, or these um, foreigners are coming into these local communities to um, lend a hand or give back, quote unquote, right? So we experienced the pandemic. And since we're now in the post-pandemic era, we've um, been able to, the, the principles of the traveler has changed. They are now looking for a renewed um, community-led type of volunteerism experience, and they are focusing on ethical, sustainable, and community-led volunteerism. So looking at the evolution of volunteerism, we were able to pinpoint a few of the challenges that um, this concept has um, brought forward. And as I said before, there were, there were concerns around the exploitation of vulnerable groups, children in particular. Um, the profit-driven model was also a concern because it then moved the focus of volunteerism from um, assisting with the needs or catering to the needs of the community and more, it made it more about tourist experiences. And then there was also a concern around the displacement of local workers because volunteers are now coming from abroad to um, do this work for free. And based on the sustainability aspect of volunteerism, um, you know, the locals are no longer able to 
uh, gain an income from the work that would have been available should the, um, the volunteers have not been there. So the primary um, aim of volunteerism is really to just positively impact the community that you're volunteering in while the host, or not the host, the, the volunteer, they are able to get that fulfillment from doing good. So due to the skepticism around volunteerism, volunteerism over the years, um, some more palatable terms for volunteer tourism were introduced, like impact travel, purposeful travel, sustainable tourism, etc. So to bring it home to the Caribbean, uh, we know that the Caribbean is a global tourism hotspot, and it really is an opportunity for us to leverage volunteerism for sustain sustainable development. We heard a lot about in the previous panel discussion about the devastation from Hurricane Beryl. So people are already coming to the Caribbean for the sun, sand, and sea experience. So what, what, it's a real benefit and an opportunity for us to also try to engage them in community projects that would help with our, our development in the areas where we have challenges. So one such case that exists in the Caribbean is the Caribbean Volunteer Exchange. And this was developed by the Volunteer Center of Trinidad and Tobago. And I want to say special kudos to the team at VCTT and the, our chief volunteer, Ms. Giselle Mendez. And the focus of the, v, the CVX is, to, is for cross-border volunteering in the Caribbean. And through the CVX, we've been able to see firsthand the, the power of collective action to bring positive, lasting change to community. The CVX has been able to gain um, NGO partners across 10 countries, and we've also been able to execute four um, CVX exchanges in Trinidad, St. Lucia, <clears throat> excuse me, Jamaica, and our last execution or exchange was in Suriname in 2019, where we were able to, uh, to implement a wash station in an underserved community in Suriname where um, we were also able to um, provide education on hygiene to primary school kids and also the rehabilitation of a bridge that connected two communities, allowing the primary school kids to get to school and their homes safely, right? So since the COVID pandemic, we have not been able to do an exchange, but I just want to touch briefly on the model of the CVX network and apart from it focusing on cross-border volunteering in the Caribbean, it's really one of the host countries or one of the countries in the network would host a, a exchange and they would be responsible for coming up with a unique development project that all our volunteers would mobilize around. And we encourage communal living, so camping in the community that we're doing the work and it will be at a school or a community center it allows for cultural immersion, and we keep that nonprofit um, model where the volunteer is responsible for um, funding their way to the country with a small contribution toward uh, food and basic amenities while they're in the um, in the country host country. And all of our projects are founded on the SDG goals, partnered with the the goals that the, um, the development goals of the country that we're in. So through the CBX model, we were able to recognize a lot, a few drivers for peace and resilience in the communities that we have been able to have exchanges in. And these look like social cohesion, um, because we, we as a Caribbean, the countries, we have more in common than we think. So it allows for that local and visitor um, connection um, through engagement. Another um, driver for peace and resilience is youth engagement and crime prevention. So having these activities, volunteer activities available, um, the youth are able to be engaged in a positive way. We have community empowerment through social and economic development. So the revenue gained through the foreign um, participation in the community and also skill sharing and skill building, the um, relationship building while these locals and volunteers ex um, engage with each other. And most of these drivers allow for benefits that um, are long-term and they, um, they see or show fruit or bear fruit long after the volunteer has left. 
So what's next for volunteerism and the CVX model? VCTT was able to successfully relaunch CVX in 2023, and in anticipation of our next project, we are evolving our approach to better marry tourism and volunteerism in the region, with focus on partnerships as a key element, ensuring that projects are sustainable and driven by community needs. And in the interest of time, I will wrap up here just to say that I hope that we can have a more positive outlook on the power of volunteerism and the new ways that it can foster peace and bring community resilience to uh, a meaningful change across the Caribbean. And every act of service, no matter how small, can sow seeds of peace in our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation, Loria. Now, you know, I took specific note of the CVX network, because as you would know, our students at the university, they are required to do an internship, a regional or international internship. And I think that this would be a fantastic opportunity because you talked about the cross-border volunteering and that delicate balance between, you know, creating a quality tourist experience, but also ensuring the positive community impact. So Lori, I will definitely be reaching out to you um, to get some further information to see how our students can actually benefit and serve as part of that network. So thank you for that presentation. Looking forward and I will share contact information as well for Very anyone good. else who's interested. Yes, please, right? I know there are other educational institutions here and I think that this would really benefit our students. Okay, so next, our next panelist, someone that I know very well, <laughs> uh, Mr. Alyosha Watki. And Alyosha is, I like to say, world-renowned, right? He is <laughs> world-renowned. Alyosha is the founding director and CEO of Tobago's most outstanding and award-winning NGO, the Environmental Research Institute, Charlottesville. And I'm very happy that Alyosha is here. His topic this um this morning is empowering futures, regenerative tourism, and gender equity in UNESCO Biosphere Reserves. And I think there's no better person to discuss these matters with us than Alyosha. So I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Leslie Ann. And now you made me blush. Um, <laughs> let's see how that works. Thank you, Narendra, for facilitating this uh, congregation and this. Uh, meaningful discussion. And um, I promise to stay in time, so nobody needs to panic. Um, I just would like to start with some small comments on my on the previous um, presentations. One is um, the one from uh, Miss King. Um, interestingly, I have worked the last three years um, on a resilient tourism strategy and guidelines for Union Island. Um, I was very familiar with many of those pictures and uh, that I've seen there in this presentation and um, my heart went definitely out to all these people I've worked with um, under Flora and Fauna International and seeing all this uh, work um, has to restart is um, sometimes quite frustrating and, and sad. But um, and it brings me back to a point there is uh, one of the key themes today was peace. Uh, we are blessed in the Caribbean, at least the small island states, that we don't have border conflicts, but we definitely will have increased um, resource conflicts um, based on the uh, prognosis what climate change can bring to us based on our um, diminishing natural and ecosystem services um, resources that we have. And obviously, and we have to be also clear, that while we all agree, and this is why we're working in this sector, that tourism has great opportunities, also tourism is um, a resource user and conflicts are um, on the, have always been a part of the tourism industry and uh, need to be resolved. And uh, I will talk a little bit about the mechanisms that we try to establish in Northeast Tobago to resolve those conflicts and keep peace, internal peace especially, um, the other uh, topic uh, really related to uh, gender equity, also there, there is um, definitely some um, work to be done in the tourism industry, if you look at it honestly, um, how many tourism enterprises 
of various sizes really have inclusivity and gender equity written on in their policies. Um, and I would like to just mention there that I'm, I'm preferring um, over gender equity um, a, a terminology where we have where we where the tourism ministry should aim to really provide inclusivity to all disadvantaged the disadvantaged members of society whether no matter what gender they are um, and there comes in the, the term of uh, pro pro tourism which is part of our tourism management plan for northeast tobago but i don't want to go um to, uh, to explain this a bit more but pro pro tourism is um aiming to assist disadvantaged people uh, in the rural communities that many of um, our Caribbean tourism actors are active in. Um, so coming to the Biosphere Reserve in Northeast Tobago, <clears throat> half of Tobago is, uh, was designated in 2020 as a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. It covers 40% um, uh, of the terrestrial and marine territory of Tobago with about 15,000 residents. It's the largest uh, biosphere reserve in the Caribbean sits. The purpose of biosphere reserves inter alia and uh, the, the special purpose that fits um, into this, into this uh, forum is that biosphere reserves are supposed to be models for knowledge exchange and platforms for shared issues that we are facing and uh, we are facing shared issues regarding tourism. And um, we hope that Northeast Tobago can be a role model how um, community-based, regenerative, sustainable, all these terms together, um, tourism can be developed for in similar rural areas in the Caribbean for the benefit and for fair benefits of all uh, residents. Um, and as such, contributing, obviously, to the UN Sustainable Development Goals towards uh, healthy ecosystems, peace and inclusion. This means as well that we have to focus on how do we bridge stakeholder interests? How do we manage stakeholder conflicts um, between um, the actors active in our biosphere reserve? And um, from my experience working in the Caribbean, the stakeholder conflicts are often very similar, often in nature, and this is why we try to build the house for the Biosphere Reserve on two major pillars. The first pillar was to establish a management plan for the Biosphere Reserve. So this is a complementary plan to, on, to those of development plans of the Tobago House of Assembly. And um, this management plan speaks very clearly on uh, the importance of healthy ecosystem services and uh, a healthy natural and cultural heritage in Northeast Tobago as the key resources for our tourism industry, as well as um, it speaks about the inclusivity that is uh, needed in order to understand what the residents really would like to see in uh, in their villages to develop. At the same time, we uh, saw that the management of the tourism sector um, often lacks the inclusivity of the various stakeholders. Uh, with the help of the IDB, we were able to establish or design the governance structure for a um, for the so-called Tobago Biosphere Management Alliance, which is a multi-sectoral um, non-for-profit organization that is consisting of the Tobago House of Assembly, the private sector, as well as NGOs. It is um, the, the governance house is built or de described. Right now, we are uh, operationalizing this organization. And the major point of this organization was that it is able to represent these three sectors and can also work if one sector is non-functional. Um, for as an example, if we are between elections and we don't have uh, proper um, structures established, 
even if the government is not fully functional between elections, this organization can function with the assistance of the private sector and the NGO sector. Or when the private sector um, has too much um, internal feuds, then the government and the NGOs can still operate the organization. So no stakeholder, no uh, sector of society can inhibit this organization from working. And we have seen this in many other Caribbean islands where um, similar organizations or national trusts um, were unfunctional if they, for example, belong to the wrong party or if the NGOs had disputes amongst each other, often on a private basis that uh, made it non-functional. And that is something that we really try to overcome. In addition, it was really designed to overcome the uh, traditional, uh, still often um, influenced, strongly influenced by our colonial past uh, governance structures. So that's, these two things will help us hopefully um, to bring the full benefits of the biosphere reserve to function and include um, the sectors of society and maintain inner peace, which is as, more, as important as the peace uh, outside. The tourism goal for Northeast Tobago in, the, in our um, management plan is described as using regenerative tourism to significantly support eco, uh, ecosystem health and services sustainable green, blue and purple economy development, positive cultural change and well-being, fair income and equitable career opportunities for residents. So now we have, <clears throat> we have examples um, of uh, regenerative tourism activities that have been established before. They have not been called as yet uh, or before regenerative tourism uh, activities. Sometimes they were called ecotourism. Sometimes they were called sustainable. Now it's uh, regenerative, but I, I like, honestly, I like the term because we're trying to regenerate um, the, the cultural, social, economic, and uh, environmental factors that the tourism sector and other sectors of society so strongly depend on. And um, so some of the activities that uh, are ongoing and uh, are have been started maybe 10, 15 years ago, but now are enforced and uh, getting much stronger attention is educational tourism in Tobago that has also an aspect of the uh, voluntourism that we just spoke about. Um, we work in agro-tourism, uh, um, agroforestry, re-establishing what we call heritage fruits. Again, um, this is regenerative because Invasive bamboo species are taken out and heritage fruits are brought in, providing food and biodiversity uh, to wildlife. And um, the interesting thing is that uh, some of the key players start to understand the power of the UNESCO Man in the Biosphere designation brand and the increasing demand of regenerative tourism products, which provide the active participation of tourists. Um, whether this is uh, regarding uh, turtle watching, whether this is a, uh, regarding um, forest check, which is a forest health um, tool that our uh, tour guides are using in the forest, whether it's reef check, which is a tool that allows us to assess the reef ecosystem health that is more or less financed by, um, by divers with, with our organization. And um, I have, I'm very happy to state that uh, our organization was able, uh, I think for the first time, to um, interest a um, boutique resort in Tobago to acknowledge that they are depending on the ecosystem services and um, the health of the, the biosphere reserve and is contributing now directly to our organization um, as a part without um, expecting a re uh, direct return. So more or less uh, a resort, a tourism resort is willing to say, we are supporting environmental or social groups without um, uh, a direct product, without a direct output, just for them making sure or um, uh, contributing to the health of the ecosystem services. And as my last sentence, Leslie, I see you. It's just that 
Uh, we spoke just recently with Narendra and uh, Leslie about um, this opportunity. We are now trying to uh, interest uh, international universities together with UE in order to create data because we are very data deficient um, that will help us to manage our systems better. Thank you so much. I hope it didn't overcome too much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so much, Alyosha. And I'm even more excited now about, as you mentioned, our conversation that we had recently about how we can involve our students in the collection of that critical data. Because, you know, based on your presentation, I could see that there's certainly a lot of room for further discussion and research on these matters as it pertains to regenerative tourism. And I think Tobago is an excellent case study. And some of the, you know, points I noted for further research, you know, I love institutional arrangements. So when you spoke about the role of government and stakeholders and how do you manage, you know, stakeholder interests and conflict, I would love to see more research on those areas. I think it would really help to drive the agenda forward for the region. And I look forward to more discussions with you and other interested parties. Thank you so much, Ali Ushar. I thank you. Yes. Thank okay. you, bye-bye. Thank you, Ali bye-bye. So our final panelist um, in today's session, this morning's session, is a gentleman that I only met recently, but I read his very impressive um, bio, and he has more than 10 years experience in the tourism industry. And therefore, I would like to invite Mr. St. Clair Solien, who is the Director of Policy and Planning at the Ministry of Tourism, Civil Aviation, Transportation and Investments. And he's going to share with us a case study of Antigua. So it's regenerative tourism in Antigua, cultivating peace through community conservation. St. Clair. Good morning, all. Um, you see my slideshow? Yes. Okay, good morning again. St. Clair Salen from Antigua and Barbuda. So we're going to look at regenerative tourism in the context of Antigua and Barbuda and how it facilitates peace. Uh, as you, I'm sure a number of persons would have been looking at Google for a definition of regenerative tourism, and you may not necessarily see a, definition, a definite definition of it. Suffice it to say, it's a concept that is being borrowed from the natural sciences, physics, medicine, agriculture, and being implanted into a social science tourism. And hence, we now have to define it in our context, or else it would be defined for us. And when that happens, it ends up being a buzzword and then a bastardized concept. So I will just go to it quickly. For us, um, regeneration tourism, we found the need for it, one, coming out of COVID, and two, having hosted SIDS, and three, how we build peace into it, bearing in mind that there will be no peace or peace without equal rights or justice, as Peter Tash would have rightly said. Now, there's a strategic pathway to this regenerative tourism. This time it's building tourism from the bottom up. You know, our normal way of building it, encouraging foreign direct investment, the big hotels, the destruction of the mangroves, blah, 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 down the road. So now we're building it from the bottom up. And this is done by one, supporting the smaller properties who in our context, we have laws that govern accommodations, like you cannot put accommodations up for tourism without it being registered, inspected, and graded by the Ministry of Tourism per an act. So this gives every person an opportunity to create accommodations in their context and in their offering. So we put that into the community as a community effort. And it's tied also to the persons who produce the local food and the, to the local tours, which takes you to places in the community and not to the established UNESCO sites or what have you, but to less known sites that are of equal importance, but less shown. In this same context, we have to consider developing the workforce to meet this new paradigm. We have to 
build resilience into the development plan. Because as you see, I go along, regenerative tourism has an aspect in every part of every aspect of tourism. Uh, it also encourages us to emerge travelers in the field. That is us through marketing, co-create what we are offering in the community. So we are not only giving visitors what we think they want, we are giving them the opportunity to help us develop what they want and they're thinking of it. So it's a shared relationship in that development. Uh, now, the community-based tourism is the foundation when we're thinking through regenerative tourism. Here, local people are encouraged to acquire the capacity to act as protagonists, attracting, tour attracting tourists to the island, to the destination. And this is said in the concept of, I can say we have a little problem and I thought it was an Antiguan problem, but going through the Caribbean, I would have noticed that there's a strong degree of littering. And I often ask my colleagues, ask my friends, what, a dri what drives that? And one of the answers I have is because people don't see the real value for themselves or for visitors in maintaining a healthy environment, clean environment. Attraction and management of tourism, upmarket of luxury items. Upmarket of luxury items, what does that mean in the concept of regenerative tourism? We have to understand that we have limited resources and anything we attempt to do, it's limited. And if it's limited, we now have to determine how we're going to brand it, create a need for it, and sell it as a luxury goods. So those are things that we are using regeneration, regenerative tourism to foster. Critical to peace, we recognize that we must change the KPIs of original tourism measurement. For example, a traditional measurement would be number of visitors. Whereas we may, a KPI may be sum of money retained in the destination. In our destination per the ECCB, we retain about a 25 cents out of every dollar. How can we move it to 35 cents? And there is where the local community comes in to start producing. Traditional number, sum of money spent in the destination. Regenerative tourism, sh share of local business in that overall spend. And as my colleague would have said before me, then you could dig further and say, share of female businesses in that spend. Traditional number of jobs created for locals. We've been um, in tourism since the early 60s, late 50s. And hence, number of jobs created is not necessarily a measuring point for us in creating equal rights and justice, which would lead to peace. Perhaps the better KPI for that would be number of middle management and upper management jobs created by the development. We go on to the future of tourism, regenerative tourism. The base, it's based on social impact, ecological impact, and the economic impact when we look at it. So we cannot just take one of the pillars. We have to consider the all out trade off when we are going along. We have to understand that Caribbean societies, Antiguan society, we're looking for, uh, citizens are looking for a bigger share and we have to understand and determine both politically and socially how we're going to afford local persons that opportunity since our tag word is tourism is everybody's business. Regenerative tourism then allows us to shape the tourism industry by putting the destination and its people first. That's basically the end, but however, um, I wish to draw you to one final part. How does it 
ties in. Regenerative tourism allows you to community empowerment and economic stability. By going into the communities and encouraging tourism enterprises, encouraging short-term rentals, we will certainly reduce that inequality. We saw that in SIDS when within six weeks we had to find accommodations for 5,000 delegates. And it, it would have had to be at an acceptable international standard and the price was bound between 100 and 150 US. And quickly we were able to find that level of small properties, small um, short-term rental properties. We created a booking engine and we were able to solve that smoothly. Also, we have to look at the cultural exchanges and understand how that comes together, how we protect our local culture, understanding where we are coming from and what we want to sell. The environmental restoration and conflict, res prevented, prevent, preventing conflict. We would have seen a video circulating early on of a situation in St. Lucia and the irony behind of it, the demonstrator was using a song from Barbados, which I think was written in the eighties by Gabby. And that was the song they were using to protest. So we could see we are in the heart of conflict still and regenerative tourism allows you from the onset to look at those things and figure out what the end game is going to be peace and how we attain that. Also inclusivity and social justice, how we achieve that, what tools we use to get it. And in thinking these things through from the onset, negotiating development, also thinking hard what we would allow and what we would not allow and what is our walk away point from a development. Because if we allow ourselves to accept things that we know fully well would lead to conflict, we'll be part and parcel of that conflict. So having cool. said that, I hope I quickly yes. gave a tidbits of to what yes. regenerative tourism in the Antigua context is. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, St. Clair. And something I made a note of, and I really thank you for challenging us to revisit how we use those or, or you know measure those KPIs to make sure that they better align with our sustainable development goals, right? And I think that's an interesting point for all of our tourism policy makers and planners in the Caribbean region. So thank you so much for bringing all of these issues to light. And I'm sure that we will have another opportunity that we could continue to discuss. I want to say thank you again to all three panelists um, in this forum. Very informative. And I turn over to you now, Narendra. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller, and to all our panelists for shedding light on such vital topics related to regenerative tourism. Your contributions will undoubtedly inspire action uh, for us uh, moving forward. Now we shift our focus to the future of tourism, and it's my pleasure to introduce the winner of the Caribbean Tourism Youth Congress, Ms. Kiana Warner, who will share her perspectives on tourism as a catalyst for peace. Kiana, please, please join us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and happy World Tourism Day to everyone. Let me share my screen. One second. Okay. <clears throat> Honorable ministers, distinguished guests, fellow young leaders and tourism advocates. Good day. It is truly an honor to stand before you as the Caribbean's Youth Junior Minister of Tourism to share my perspective on today's theme as the Caribbean Youth Junior Minister of Tourism. I speak not only as a representative of my region, but as a voice for the youth who are passionate about the transformative power of and its potential to foster peace, understanding and harmony. As a young person growing up in the Caribbean, I've had the privilege of living in a place that welcomes people from all walks of life. 
Our islands are a crossroad where cultures blend and each visitor leaves a part of themselves with us, just as they take a piece of the Caribbean spirit home. This exchange between visitors and locals is at the very heart of tourism. It is about time. It is about more than seeing beautiful landscapes. It's about connecting with people, sharing stories, building bridges across borders. I believe that I believe that it is these connections that make tourism a powerful source for peace. Tourism, tourism encourages us to see the world through the eyes of others. When people travel, they step out of their comfort zones and into someone else's reality. Whether it's tasting new foods, learning about customs and traditions, or even facing language barriers, travel forces us to understand different perspectives. It teaches us that while we may come from different places, we share common dreams, struggles, and values. As young people, we are particularly open to these kinds of experiences. In fact, many of us embrace them. We live in a world where it is easy to stay connected through social media. We see what's happening across the globe, and when we travel, we want to be a part of the cultures and communities we encounter. We don't just visit places, we immerse ourselves in them. This mindset of our curiosity and openness is something the youth bring to tourism and something we believe can help foster peace. When people meet on common ground, whether that ground is a marketplace in Nevis or a beach in Antigua, they begin to understand what divides us is way smaller than what unites us. I believe that the youth have a natural role as peace ambassadors because we approach differences not with fear, but with a sense of discovery. We want to know, what can I learn from you? What do we have in common? However, beyond individual connections, tourism also has the power to heal division on a larger scale. The Caribbean knows all too well the wounds left by conflict and colonialism, but uh, we also know the power of resilience and reconnection. Tourism offers a path towards peace by allowing countries with complicated histories to interact positively. When tourists visit places, they have in endured conflict, whether it's a memorial site or a community rebuilding itself, they become witnesses to both pains of the past and hope of the future. This is why I believe tourism has a role to play in peace building by bringing people face to face with history and showing them how far communities have come, it fosters understanding and empathy. These are the seeds of peace and understanding that despite our past, we can move forward together, stronger and more unified. Sustainable tourism is another important factor in this conversation. As we think about peace, we must also consider the harmony between tourists and the communities they visit. Too often, tourism can overwhelm or exploit local cultures, leaving more harm than good. However, when done responsibly, tourism can becomes a two-way street, benefiting not only the visitor, but also the local community as well. Permit me to draw reference to some prime examples within the region, starting with my twin island paradise, St. Kitts and Nevis, where we have the sustainably sound boutique properties like the Golden Rock Hotel in Nevis and Kittishan Hill in St. Kitts, where an emphasis is placed on things such as protecting and promoting the local fauna, such that in the case of Golden Rock, the fauna has become one with the property and the long-standing sugar mill has been carefully and creatively transformed into a signature suite. While at Kittishan Hill, there is an emphasis on organic farming and sourcing seafood from local fishermen in the nearby communities. There is even the opportunity at this resort sanctuary for tourists to go on tours of the organic farm to learn the health of the health properties of the various herbs, teas, and spices that are naturally grown there. This is the interconnection between tourism, tourism and peace, creating substantive and practical linkages between tourist, tourism and operations and the skills, knowledge, and livelihoods of people in the local communities. Let us take a look at the islands of St. Lucia. Here, 
We see how natural features and attractions such as the sulfur springs and mud baths, the Ted Paul Nature Trail, and even the Creole Month celebrations have been carefully developed and curated to appeal both local and international tourists and become signature features of St. Lucia's tourism product. I must also make mention of the beautiful Cayman Islands. They have utilized their seascape and marine life as a tourist attraction to allow tourism development and marine conservation to become one, for example, Stingray City and Cayman Turtle Center. I am proud to represent a region that takes pride in its heritage, environment, and people. As a young leader in tourism, my ministry is committed to ensuring tourism serves as a tool for empowerment and sustainable development. We want to see local communities thrive with the benefits of tourism being shared widely, creating not just economic opportunities, but also fostering respect and appreciation for our cultures and natural environments. When tourism is sustainable, it can promote peace by creating mutual respect between visitors and locals. It encourages us it encourages travelers to leave places better than they found them and to engage with communities in ways that uplift rather than exploit. For us, the youth, this is the kind of tourism we believe in. Tourism that builds bridges, not walls. Lastly, I'd like to emphasize on the role of youth sharing to shaping the future of tourism. We are the next generation of travelers, tour operators, policy makers, and we have the responsibility to ensure that tourism continues to be a force for good. We must advocate for tourism's, the tourism industry that prioritizes peace, inclusivity, and sustainability. As young people, we are innovators and visionaries. We are using technology to create new travel experiences, promote responsible tourism, tourism and raise awareness about the importance of cultural exchange. With tools like social media, we can share the stories of the places we visit, shedding light on the beauty of diversity and the importance of protecting people and environments that make travel so special. In doing so, we are using tourism to promote peace one traveler at a time. In conclusion, tourism has the potential to be one of the most powerful forces for peace in the world. It can break down barriers, foster understanding, and create harmony among the nations. As young people, we are excited to be a part of this movement, and we believe that tourism, when done right, can help us build a more peaceful, just, and compassionate world. Thank you. Wow, that was uh, extremely, extremely uh, well presented. You know, thank you so much, Kiana, for your inspiring insights. And it's clear that the future of tourism rests in the hands of our youth and your voice, just hearing you speak with that much passion and so on, it, it's like a beacon of hope, you know, for the industry going forward. Now, we just have two more items left. One is a brief summary of today and today's outcomes, and I will do that. And then I shall hand over to my colleague, Miss Amanda Charles. So <clears throat> today, the key outcomes, now five things stood out today. One was uh, we dealt with enhanced resilience and recovery strategies. We heard all about it. We heard about the proactive measures and um, that not only to respond to immediate crisis, but also to ensure long-term peace and stability in the tourism sector. We also heard about uh, integration of peace building principles, you know, discussions explored how embedding peace building principles into tourism practices can enhance the region's ability to adapt and thrive, right? That's two. Three, we heard through most of the speakers uh, on a commitment to sustainable development and regenerative tourism, you know, participants underscored the necessity of sustainable tourism development practices as integral to fostering peace and prosperity. Number four, the power of youth and communities. You know, we, we heard about that uh, uh, throughout um, the presentations and of course, um, through Kiana's voice as well. 
and her presentation we got that and of course one common thread that ran throughout most of the presentations they all spoke about from the time uh, the the conference was the forum sorry was opened at nine or nine o five we started hearing that word collaboration and collaborative approaches and so on and that ran throughout the entire conference so again <clears throat> um the Caribbean World Tourism Day Forum 2024, it, it, to me, it successfully reinforced the team resilience and renewal, building a peaceful uh, future. Uh, it called for a unified commitment to using tourism as a bridge for understanding the cooperation. The insights and recommendations from this forum will, um, the insights, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the insights and recommendations from this forum will inform future actions and policies aimed at enhancing the tourism sector's contribution to peace, sustainability, and economic prosperity across the Caribbean. I now take this time, you know, as we approach the, the end of our forum, you know, I would like to invite Ms. Amanda Charles, Sustainable Tourism Specialist at the CTO, to provide uh, a vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Narendra. Special thanks to you for a really excellent job in serving as chairperson for this year's World Tourism Day Forum. Happy World Tourism Day, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure as we conclude this year's celebration to thank each of you for your participation in today's virtual forum. It has been an inspiring gathering underscored by our collective commitment to the theme, resilience and renewal, building a peaceful future. And of course, this was aligned to the global theme of tourism for peace as designated by the United Nations World Tourism Organization. This year's theme invites the Caribbean to envision a tourism sector that not only drives economic growth, but champions peace, inclusivity, and sustainability. It calls for a collective commitment to using tourism as a catalyst for building bridges, fostering environments where people, communities, and nations can flourish together. As Narendra would have recapped, we heard invaluable insights from our distinguished panelists and speakers who shared um, their experiences and expertise, notably Honorable Ian Goodill Edgehill, Ian Goodin Edgehill, the CTO's chairman and Minister of Tourism of Barbados. We heard remarks from the CTO Secretary General, Mrs. Donna Regis Prosper, Mr. Destang, new president of the CHDA, and of course, the video presentation from the Secretary General of UN Tourism. I would like to commend and thank our keynote speaker, Mr. Timothy Marshall, chairman of the International Institute for Peace Through Tourism for his groundbreaking and compelling remarks. Mr. Marshall highlighted the three pillars of peace with God, peace with each other, and peace with nature, also showcasing the critical work of the Institute and, the, and their numerous initiatives to champion peace through the establishment of peace villages and peace parks around the world. The first panel session explored how integrating peace building principles into crisis response and recovery can enhance the region's ability to adapt and thrive amidst adversity. Special thanks to moderator, Ms. Christine Young, and panelists, the Honorable Adrian Thomas, Mrs. Phelan King, and Mr. John Biles for sharing their experiences and expertise with us. The second panel discussed the role of volunteerism, regenerative tourism, environmental stewardship and community engagement in contributing to peace and prosperity. 
Special thanks to the moderator, Dr. Leslie Ann Jordan Miller, and panelists, Lorian Pollard, Alyosha Wateki, and St. Clair Solen for sharing their best practices. Our forum today culminated with a special treat as we celebrated the voice of the youth, the future of Caribbean tourism. I commend Ms. Kiana Warner, the Caribbean Junior Minister of Tourism and winner of the CTO Tropical Shipping Regional Tourism Youth Congress. Kiana hails from Nevis and we thank her so much for her visionary insights. As Narendra would have noted, the future of our industry is in safe hands. I take this opportunity to thank the team at the CTO Secretariat, Suzette Kelman, Sharon Coward, and of course, Narendra, for their diligent efforts towards the convening and hosting of the forum. On a more personal note, on the cusp of my departure as the Sustainable Tourism Specialist at the CTO, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to colleagues in the Ministries of Tourism and Tourism Authorities in CTO member countries across the region, our regional and international partner agencies, donor entities, the various academic institutions, NGOs, tourism businesses, and a wider Caribbean tourism stakeholder community for the collaboration given to me in my role and the tremendous support provided as we engaged in numerous initiatives for capacity building projects, um, the development of tools and knowledge products to foster the sustainability, resilience, and inclusive growth of Caribbean tourism over the past eight years. As I say farewell, I am pleased to hand over the baton to Narendra, and I am confident that he will continue to champion responsible tourism and resilience in the ongoing work of the CTO through equitable public-private and community partnerships, which remain critical for long-term sustainability. And in that regard, you know, we count on your continued collaboration and support. Thank you all once again for participating in today's virtual forum. And let us carry the spirit of this event into our work and continue to advocate for a peaceful future through tourism. Thanks all. Happy World Tourism Day and have a great weekend. Thank you. Over to you, Narendra. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks again for joining us.